please welcome Austin to S4's Stage 2. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, how many people in the audience today use virtualization in an IT environment? By show of hands. Yeah? Right on. Okay. How many people use virtualization in an OT environment? Or have encountered it before? Yeah? A few less. Okay. Now, how many people believe we're living in a virtual machine right now? <laughs> yeah? Good, that's good. I can tell this is an open-minded audience because uh, I'm going to need you to be a little open-minded as we talk about some conceptual things here with PLC virtualization. Uh, now, in the keynote, Dale talked about asking better questions. And that's kind of what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about PLC virtualization, and we're going to uh, use the Socratic method of asking challenging questions as we explore possibility and potential of sort of full PLC virtualization. And uh, we're going to talk about the, uh, the benefits of PLC virtualization, the current state of PLC virtualization in the industry, and uh, the impact for vendors as well as end customers. So let's start with definitions, right? How do we define virtualization? Now, virtualization, quite simply put, is software that looks and behaves like specific hardware. And within the IT industry, this has had tremendous impact. Uh, all we, we all know that the cost savings and performance increases and uh, efficiencies uh, have been gained through virtualization. I would say that in the past 60 years of IT, no other technology has had more quantifiable benefits than virtualization. Uh, and we're seeing those benefits in the OT industry as well, to a lesser extent and, and only more recently, but we're seeing that in the, uh, the Linux and the Windows machines. Uh, and uh, we have seen some uh, virtualized PLCs and, and soft PLCs try to enter the market in the past, like the Steeplechase Visual Logic Controller and the uh, Rockwell Soft Logics Controller. These things tried to come out to the market, but they didn't really take off because people had sort of this stigma about Windows-based PLCs versus uh, industrial assets, and, and rightly so, because you know, Windows hasn't been super reliable and, and uh, doesn't have the same lifespan as uh, industrial assets. But how, how do we define a fully virtualized PLC? Now, this is the conceptual part, okay? Uh, if you think about how VMware is this software layer that's able to run Windows and Unix and Linux and BSD with a single software platform on uh, commodity hardware. Imagine a, a virtual PLC container that's able to run Rockwell and Siemens and GE on a single commodity set of, I, uh, of sorry, OT hardware. So it would have to virtualize not only the, the CPU, which we see a lot of today, but also the I.O. cards and the backplane and the network. So we're going to explore that potential possibility uh, throughout this presentation. So why would we virtualize PLCs? I mean, why are we messing with a good thing here? Why are we even talking about this today? Um, what, what benefits could it possibly have? Now, first of all, cost. Uh, PLCs are pretty expensive today. I don't know if you've ever tried to buy one, but they're, they're not cheap. Uh, and uh, a lot of this cost is uh, uh, due to, of course, the quality of the equipment, but also there's sort of a vendor lock-in effect that occurs. It's, it's sort of this uh, artificial monopoly that when you buy a GE or a Rockwell or a Siemens uh, piece of hardware, you are locked in for the long term for 15 years or 10 years of the life cycle of that product. Uh, so it creates this this vendor handcuff that's very difficult to break without tearing out all that equipment and replacing it with other equipment. And as part of that, there's a distribution model through electrical distribution companies uh, that have sort of exclusive territorial uh, sales channels with these PLC uh, equipment and vendors and DCS vendors that uh, also add, uh, add to the cost and don't add a lot of value. So if we were to create a more commodity controller that could be virtualized and run across multiple software platforms, 
uh, it would disrupt that entire uh, distribution, PLC distribution chain. And uh, flexibility. With a virtualized PLC container, uh, you'd be able to uh, do some more interesting things with architecture. Uh, the, the PLC software may think that uh, cards are in a certain rack, but you could distribute them in other locations or add additional layers of redundancy that weren't initially intended as part of those PLC solutions. And also uh, support, support. We've seen a lot of IT support cases with virtualization. Easier to deploy patches, easier to do snapshots and rollbacks and things like that. And I see similar advantages of a full virtualized PLC, being able to roll back things, test things in a virtual environment, like the GE Digital Twin that uh, they've been talking about for a while. Uh, so there, there are support possibilities as well. And uh, also performance. Of course, in IT virtualization, we see a, a huge benefit there. Lots of opportunities to increase performance. And that's uh, an issue we see with a lot of the industrial CPUs today is they're very limited in the CPU and memory capacity that they have. So being able to leverage more commodity hardware to increase that performance would be a great benefit. Now, are there cybersecurity benefits <clears throat> to PLC virtualization? I would argue that there are. First of all, this virtual container, it wouldn't be a real-time OS like a Wind River or a QNX operating system. It would be more like a Linux or maybe a Windows-based uh, OS that's more used to being uh, resilient, used to being on the internet, used to being exposed to attacks, and doesn't completely crash if it gets a weird Nmap scan or a ping. So that would kind of create this this inherent uh, layer of protection. And when you have the whole PLC stack containerized, you're able to do some more interesting things with the uh, uh, monitoring of the network traffic within that environment. Everything would be encapsulated in that layer <coughs> uh, in this virtual environment. So you could do things like software-defined networking very easily uh, and get better control over your north south and east-west traffic to create finer rules, better anomaly detection, and uh, a real zero trust environment in that virtual container is much more attainable. And of course, there's some reliability uh, benefits as well, which is, of course, part of security. So easy to roll out patches and testing and uh, uh, easier to roll back and uh, add additional layers of redundancy if required. But of course, as we've seen in the Internet of Things, there are risks to the commoditization of hardware. Uh, when you try to create a product that is as cheap as possible, often cybersecurity is a feature that's left out. So it's one thing we need to certainly watch out for. So looking back over the past 50 years of PLCs, what has made the PLC a success in the industry? So if we look back at uh, the General Motors standard machine controller, RFP, they talked about a low-cost, reliable, industrial, modular, solid-state, maintainable system that could allow them to uh, do turnarounds faster. When they, when they switched from one model car to another model car, they didn't have to rewire all the relays. They could do all that in software. Uh, and a lot of those, all of those things are still true today, but certainly the, uh, the solution could be lower cost, it could be more reliable, it could be more industrial, it could be more, more modular and easier to maintain. So depending on if you believe the Purdue model is dead or not, uh, we're going to take a look at the virtualization in today's OT environment at, uh, at different levels. And of course, we, we frequently see virtualization, uh, particularly on Windows and Linux assets, on level five, right down to level two in the supervisory control. Now we do, uh, we are seeing more instances of uh, virtualized controllers in the level one area, particularly around uh, DCS environments for, for specific use cases, and, and we'll talk about that soon. But the interesting thing about these virtualized controllers is uh, the vendors don't really have SKU numbers for them. They're, they're typically not a product you can buy unless you are one of the special cases that, that uh, hit that, uh, that use case, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And of course, level zero instrumentation. We don't really virtualize the physical gear, the pumps and the motors, unless you believe we're living in a virtual machine right now. 
so why are some sites virtualized today? Now, the, the demand for more data and more granular data continues to increase every day. Manufacturers of equipment are deploying uh, devices that have more and more I.O., faster I.O., more data that the organizations crave. You know, we're, we're getting into big data and analytics and uh, um, AI and using all this data to improve our processes and, and create efficiencies and, and find ways of uh, improving the process. So what's, what this is doing is, uh, is demanding more out of the, the I.O. controllers. We're adding more, more screens, more I.O., and uh, we quickly run into a situation where the, the CPU, these tiny CPUs that are really underpowered in most cases, are getting overloaded. And uh, in some cases, the vendor gets to a point, or the customer gets to a point where there's no more CPUs they can buy. They've reached the, the highest level of CPU that that vendor provides. There's no more RAM they can add. There's no more, there's no more additional CPUs that can be added. And the customer uh, really demands a solution from the vendor. So what we're seeing uh, across a number of different DCS vendors uh, is the virtualization of these controllers. So when they hit that peak, they will, they will add in uh, commodity IT hardware and uh, use that as the processing, the CPU for these control systems, rather than the traditional industrial hardened uh, I.O. And, and uh, I mean, not I.O., but traditionally hardened CPUs that we've seen in the past. And this works well in DCS environments because often those servers are in uh, climate controlled areas of the plant anyway, so they don't need to be overly industrialized. So what are the other use cases we see for CPU virtualization today? Uh, PLC simulators, a lot of PLC programming environments have a simulator built in, which is a virtualized PLC that allows you to test your programs prior to putting them into production. Uh, and research, this is what sort of inspired this presentation is uh, using environments like QMU and uh, other virtualization uh, software. We're able to emulate uh, Wind River and uh, other real-time OSs uh, and uh, do vulnerability and, and threat research to take pieces of code from the firmware of a PLC and execute it and see what happens and step through that code to see how it behaves to find vulnerabilities or see how malware is uh, potentially impacting them. And finally, the DCS controllers. Uh, a lot of DCS vendors do sell a testing environment, a simulation environment that uh, can be used to uh, flush out issues in your control system prior to putting it into production. And this is quite often virtualized. And a lot of the vendors, the DCS and PLC vendors, won't build the software against uh, physical hardware. They'll certainly test it, but during development, they're often using a virtualized instance of these PLCs while they're, while they're running through the uh, uh, firmware process because it's just more efficient. But there's more than just CPU virtualization in our in our definition of a fully virtualized PLC. Going back to the definition of virtualization, it's, it's software that looks and behaves like specific hardware. And there's multiple hardware components in a PLC. Of course, there's the CPU, but there's also the backplane, the I.O. cards, the network. All of these things would need to be virtualized in order to create that over all-encompassing container. Now, we know that CPU virtualization is uh, possible because we're doing it today at a lot of plants. Uh, but there's also the possibility, uh, uh, the, I mean, the other challenge we need to overcome is the latency tolerance. And traditional IT virtualization is really focused on throughput over latency. And that's very impactful for OT technology because operational technology is deterministic. There is, a, there is a standard scan cycle that needs to be completed in a set amount of time, or the process will trip and fault and cause an outage. So there's been some studies that have been conducted uh, that have estimated this backplane latency tolerance uh, per each industry. One of the fastest latency tolerances is uh, the motion control industry, where there's robotic arms uh, swinging around and need to be monitored at a very high frequency. So those are uh, only tolerant to 250 microseconds, which each microsecond, of course, is a millionth of a second, so very, very small window. Electrical control is a little bit faster at 280, and process control, like uh, 
a water system or oil and gas is, is much higher at 800 microseconds. So uh, those, are, those are pretty short windows that you need to adhere to in order to uh, prevent a process from tripping on the backplane virtualization. But there has been a, a study done by uh, IEEE back in 2016 where they uh, tried to address this issue. They tried to use commodity Intel-based hardware to create a PLC virtualization environment. And they were able to successfully drop the latency well below uh, the requirements to 10 or 20 microseconds uh, by disabling a lot of the performance-based issues like hyper-threading uh, and some of the built-in virtualization technologies that are more focused on throughput than latency. So we, we do know that it is possible to virtualize the backplane of these PLCs. So let's take a look at what that would even look like. So today, a, a typical PLC looks like this. We've got a, a CPU, a rack, uh, a controller, I.O. cards, and then usually it's connected to a network, of course. So if we were to, to create a virtualization layer around this, suddenly we're able to potentially get rid of the rack, replace the, the CPU with maybe an industrial uh, PC or a, a proper server, depending on the conditions in the environment. We're able to move racks and cards around because that whole back plane is virtualized. Those cards could be anywhere, and the, the PLC would still believe they're on the same physical rack. Uh, and then uh, moving that back plane to a fiber optic network, uh, a low latency fiber optic network, rather than the old serial bus that uh, they've traditionally had would allow it to uh, spread across a plant or, or allow a lot more flexibility in how those cards are deployed. And of course, you'd still have situations where you'd want to mount them on a traditional DIN rail and things like that, but you, the virtualization would open up a lot more possibilities. And what would the software look like? At the software layer, here we have an engineering workstation, and uh, it's communicating with a PLC in the field, which it believes to be a physical PLC. So you're using something like um, Unity XL or, or uh, Logic Studio to communicate and program these PLCs. Uh, and it behaves and uh, uh, performs just like you're communicating with a physical PLC. But really, it's talking to a virtualization layer that's encapsulating all that data, all that traffic, and, and emulating the cards, the rack, the network, so that it appears to be that physical PLC. So it would be completely invisible to the programming and, and maintenance software. So if we look back at the personal computer, um, how would this impact automation vendors? Uh, and, and there's a good reason why they don't really advertise these virtual PLCs or virtual controllers because um, they're, they're a bit afraid of what this would mean to their hardware business. Traditionally, these companies have sold hardware, and that's been a, a, a good portion of their revenue. So suddenly becoming a, a software um, company is, is a bit of a, a scary proposition. Uh, and, and moreover, um, moving towards a commoditized product is also a scary uh, possibility for a lot of these automation vendors, I'm sure. Uh, but if you look back at the personal computer, uh, originally there was the IBM PC that came out, uh, and uh, a couple of the original vendors were HP and IBM in the market. And uh, IBM uh, eventually got out of the PC business because it was becoming too commoditized for them. Uh, they just didn't see it as, as a profit center anymore. But uh, HP, they considered getting out of that business, but then they doubled down on that business and they decided to focus on quality, uh, building better products, becoming a premium product in that space. And that's continued to grow their business and be a year-over-year -year growth center for HP. So how does this tie into PLC virtualization? So uh, when, a, when any kind of hardware is commoditized, um, you can either get out of that business or try to create like a premium product. I think there's lessons to be learned for uh, PLC vendors in this space. So how does this benefit vendors? Now, competitive displacement is a big one. 
Once an account is lost, once an account goes to a GE or a Rockwell or a Schneider, and they've made that multi, multi-million dollar commitment to that hardware, they're not going to be changing anytime soon. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult to get in there and uh, uh, get your uh, product in there after they've made that incredible investment in uh, hardware. But if this were a virtualized container, it would be much easier to uh, displace that competitor if they're no longer happy with their vendor. Uh, it would give an opportunity to uh, migrate things to, uh, uh, from a Schneider to a GE or, or so forth. If, uh, if required. So it would kind of break those handcuffs that a lot of customers are in today with their investment in, uh, in PLCs. Uh, it would also allow the vendors to focus on the software. We've certainly come a long way with the development of uh, PLC programs and uh, the engineering environments that are out there today, but it's still not very user-friendly and, and still has a, a ways to go to become a better software product. Um, for programming and development of these, uh, of these uh, systems. So it would enable the vendors to become more focused on software than the hardware. The, uh, the hardware would be more generic and, and uh, open. Uh, and finally, uh, market share. We're already seeing a lot of erosion of um, the market share, in particular markets in, in smaller systems uh, that are looking for cheaper, low-cost uh, PLC solutions. Uh, and there's a lot of new vendors coming out of places like Taiwan that offer very low-cost PLC solutions uh, to the market today. So we're starting to see that market erode a little bit. Uh, but uh, there are also a lot of opportunities in uh, new markets. Uh, when I announced I was talking about virtualized PLCs, I had a few different uh, customers reach out to me in excitement. Uh, one was a biotech company that really felt the traditional PLC wasn't uh, sufficient for their model. It, it didn't give them enough, enough flexibility to do a lot of the batch creation and uh, experimentation that they, they needed to do in their environment. Uh, so they were looking for alternatives. They were quite excited to hear about the possibility of, of a virtualized PLC. They were disappointed I didn't actually have a product or anything to, to show them. It was all conceptual, but, but they were excited by the possibility. Another uh, person who reached out was uh, uh, an, uh, um, a VP of innovation at a major uh, oil and gas company. And uh, they were interested in the idea of a lower cost PLC solution uh, with this whole demand for more data uh, uh, that's, that's constant and ev uh, never letting up. Uh, they find that the cost of PLCs today are actually stifling innovation. Uh, it's, it's very expensive to deploy a control system with the, uh, the hardware costs and, uh, and programming costs, so uh, creating more of a commodity product that can be deployed uh, more ubiquitously uh, is very appealing to some of these large organizations. All right, and uh, now we'll open it up for questions. We'll keep this kind of debate going. All right, thanks, Austin. I'm Dan Scali. I'm with Dragos. I'll be the moderator for the q and If there's any questions, let me know. I'll run the mic around. Hey, Austin. Um, quick question. What do you think about, uh, from a security perspective, VM escape? Uh, I mean, have you thought about that? Are there concerns there? Uh, Yes, uh, certainly we've seen in the Windows IT uh, domain and Linux domain that uh, virtual machine escape is uh, certainly a concern, but um, that would require the code to be executing within uh, that VM. So um, they'd have to get pretty far into the network uh, to get to that point. A lot of the VM escapes uh, happen from an initial entry point where someone is um, opening an email or uh, there's an exploit that's been run or, or something has op exposed that server to allow that exploit to, to run. So uh, it, it's certainly a possibility, uh, but less likely than we see in a lot of the IT uh, VM escapes. But yeah, certainly a concern. I agree. Yeah, so Paul from Shell. So excellent presentation, Austin. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Um, you mentioned uh, breaking the handcuffs. Are you aware 
of the OPATH, uh, Open Process Automation Forum, and to what extent do you think that they're talking about virtualization in this area? Uh, it's a great, great question. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of them, but um, I, I'm not sure if virtualization uh, plays a part in that, uh, in their plans. It, it, from my research, I didn't see uh, any uh, mention of that. Okay, thanks. Jalal Boudada from Applied Risk. Great presentation, uh, Austin. Thank you um, so much. Uh, One question with regards to the proprietary protocols for certain vendors. Uh, have you thought about how, what will be the impact if you're trying to adopt virtualization for certain vendors that might have some proprietary protocols that vendors are not willing to release or share? Yes, and that's a very good point. In order to fully virtualize it, you would need to emulate all of those protocols and, and reverse engineer those protocols, which um, I have personal experience with this, and even without the vendor support, it's possible, uh, but ideally it would be through the support of a, a vendor. Well, one point I'd like to make quickly is um, it, whoever does this, if it's, if it's a third-party company or a, a vendor, uh, if they're able to establish themselves as the, the VMware of PLC virtualization, they'll have tremendous market influence. Hey, Austin, Dan Schaefer at Phoenix Contact. Great job. Thank you. Uh, do you feel there's, uh, with the technical hurdles starting to fall, do you feel it's uh, inevitable that this is the path that we go down? Or do you think there's still going to be significant resistance? It's a, it's a great question. Uh, and I, I do believe that uh, with the benefits I'm seeing, it, it will be an inevitable uh, draw into that area. Uh, I mean, we're seeing everything virtualized uh, these days, uh, and, and then the next iteration of that is going to the cloud and things like that, cloud instances. So uh, it, it's sort of, uh, I feel it's inevitable that that will uh, inevitably <laughs> uh, encompass PLCs as well. Hey, uh, Austin, great uh, food for thought here. From a vulnerability research perspective, you know, I think everybody's kind of considered virtualization as kind of a panacea, right? We can get broader uh, access to some of these things to do testing, testing in a non-destructive kind of environment or format. Uh, what do you think about um, the limitations that virtualization places on that type of research? And, and what I'm getting at is that lots of times it's the specific hardware's way of interpreting things that leads to some of these vulnerabilities. And I'm wondering how uh, representative some of these virtualized environments could be uh, from, a, from a research perspective. That's a, that's a really great question, Marty. Uh, and it would need to identically emulate that environment in order to be successful. So, um, but that is one of the advantages of, of this as well. Uh, I mean, G you talked about the digital twin, but when you create that virtual environment, uh, you, can, you can migrate that to another area and do testing that you wouldn't ever be able to do uh, in a physical environment. And the, the control system, the best part is the control system would actually believe it's a physical environment. So it should be uh, no different from your testing environment if it was done properly and, and emulated properly. So great question. All right, we got time for just one more. You addressed the, uh, the network latency, and I have no trouble really believing that. What about things like interrupt latency on the programming side, the software side? Uh, have you thought about that? Uh, that's, that's a great question, and um, I haven't really thought about that. There hasn't been much research done in that area uh, that I saw, so uh, it's a good point, and uh, it's, it's largely uncovered. So more, more work is, is to be done to really... Uh, uh, flush this idea out. 